How well do you understand the problem space? How well do you know your customer? How do you know it's needed now? How big is the market opportunity? What is the competitive landscape? Why do you think you can solve it better? Do we have the right people put together? Mm. So those are the things that you kind of look for as quick signals to see, okay, do you have the right team working on the right problems at the right time, right? So therefore you were able to minimize the risk you were taking with a startup when you decide to say, yes, uh, I'm going to put my money on it. This is an episode with a great friend of mine, Greg Kakil. Greg is an experienced product manager in the AI space, but also an investor in the AI startup world. So you can see this episode as your go-to for learning about the startup world and also the investment world. Greg offers amazing insights on where he invests in companies or not, and what he looks for for a company. We also discuss the pitfalls and the market signals to look for. Greg is also super active on LinkedIn, where he has built a great following in the AI space of nearly 200,000 people. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a like and a five-star review wherever you are listening. I hope you enjoy it. Well, hey guys, uh, thanks Louis for uh, having me to your podcast. I know we've been talking about that for a long time and now I'm here and I appreciate your patience in getting me into your awesome uh, platform. I'm Greg Kukio. I uh, work for one of the things out there and I am passionate about technology. My background is in industry engineering, and I have been tinkering with data for quite a bit. So in industry engineering settings, you can think about things such as statistical process controls and other supply chain management, forecasting, et cetera. Those are the things that you're probably familiar with if you're in the data space. Back then, we didn't call these forecasting models, machine learning, et cetera, but that's really what we're doing. I remember before ML, AI was a thing. I was working with third-party vendors of specialized camera systems that would take a look at our production lines and send signals to our machines to make adjustments to reduce quality defects, for example. And today, we're thinking about computer vision with more sophisticated architectures that allows us to scale the reduction of uh, quality defects. So this journey has taken me to tech, to the tech world. And also at the mean t- in the meantime, I've been really vocal on social platforms, most namely uh, LinkedIn, where I've been pushing out content around technology, AI, machine learning, et cetera, where I was able to gather a nice group of communities who felt uh, connected with the messages. And I've been very honored to be named uh, Top Voice twice by LinkedIn. And, you know, I still continue this journey today and trying to make sense of what's going on in the world at the macro and micro level, uh, especially today, now that the world is trying to figure out what's going on with this thing called GNAI. So it's been quite the journey and things are changing so fast that uh, people are really struggling with knowing how to ingest information. But so here I am, Greg Kukio, who vows to simplify the number of the amount of information coming in from all avenues to make it simple for folks to consume when I issue a post, for example. Um, And I also invest on my spare time. I mentor startups, uh, the founders. Um, I advise when I can. And I connect them with people who can bring value to them as well. And I work with companies like Madrona, uh, especially Madrona Ventures Labs, to mentor or uh, moderate sessions with startup founders and brainstorm ideas and the hard to solve problems to figure out what are the different technologies, what are the different go to markets uh, and other strategies we need to bring to the table to improve people's lives, et cetera. And uh, I really do enjoy that. And 
Uh, and I enjoy talking to you too, Luis. So thanks again. I know this was a long intro, intro but uh, we need to make sure people knew who I am. And by the way, I'm from Haiti. I uh, speak French and Creole, uh, just like Luis. Uh, we, we both speak French and uh, great to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot. And that, that was a, a great introduction. Very complete. I I will definitely talk about startups and I want to <clears throat> first start with, maybe I can start with how did you start to invest in, in startups? What If you can share what's the first one or, or just like approximately when did you get into that and what made you take the leap to like give finally give money or advice uh, with your time? Well, first of all, when I was in college, I started, I had a startup and going into the activities of asking people for money is not, it's not new to me. Uh, this time I'm the one giving money. And it was quite an experience because most people I was going out there uh, door to door to ask money to, they wanted to see how much skin in the game I had. So as a founder, uh, you have to show, you have to give the investor confidence about how much time you're willing to spend on this idea that you feel strongly about uh, to convince them. So I've been, I've been familiar with that, right? So I was on the receiving end at some point, although not successful, but I've had some good learnings on this journey. So I've always wanted to be a startup investor. It was only a matter of time until I felt comfortable with one, my lifestyle to the space I wanted to invest in. And uh, three, the quality of network, people network that that would give me if I were to go into it. So I had to explore all of that to say when is the right time to to start acting. To tell you the truth, I can't even remember when I was. It's only recently I started really doing like giving, for formally giving startups uh, seeds pre seed money uh, for investments. Prior to that, it was more of a friend to friend investment in a handshake. Mm in hoping that something works. Uh, but now it's a little bit more formal. I take a, a deeper look into the startup. But long story short here is curiosity again, you know, got me there. And you you walk into an environment and you stay in it long enough, you'll start finding folks who are who believe in certain aspects of life and some of them will resonate and some of them will not. So when I found folks around me when I moved to Seattle who were very passionate about investing, I started to lean in and listening and learning and I started to take the leap as well. But of course, it was a measured leap because I had to account for the lifestyle, taking care of family, etc. What does that do? So how do you really budget for that, et cetera. And then what do you select? And for that, you have to make calculated risk, understanding what what works and or what doesn't work or why, understanding why startups fail, understanding what makes startups successful and under, or trying to find a framework for sizing the, I guess, the the risk that you're taking, right? And what people don't understand is that when they work for, a company or when they go out to go drive to go to work or when they invest in a company, they're taking risk. And these risks, they may not be comparing to each other, but they also have a value, right? Some risk are higher than others. Yeah. And some risk may be high and they may return a high value. They may be some risk are low, they return a low value. Some risk are low and they return a high value. I mean, you have to understand these, how these play into each other to kind of make a decision. What can paralyze you, and I didn't allow that to paralyze me, is not seeing the world as a with a binary lens. And in life, you have to find a way to balance everything. There's pros and cons in anything you look into. 
And at some point, I had to. I felt like it was the right time to pull the trigger. And because I was already in the AI world, I was like, let me look into this AI startup world to see if I can find the right folks to guide me in terms of how to venture into that. So that's pretty much how I got, got into it. And why choosing to invest in startups in the AI space rather than going for like a publicly traded company like Google or like some a big one in the AI space? Why investing in something, I guess, much more risky, but with high potential? Like mo I guess most people like me right now that don't have unlimited money in invest in like anything public that is somewhat safe. So why, what, if if you wanted to go for something AI related, why not? Why, why choose a smaller and more risky company than a, the bigger one? Yeah, it it's a question of risk reward tolerance, not just risk tolerance, but risk reward tolerance, right? As I mm. mentioned before, some big risk may return big reward, and I'm comfortable with that, right? Some small risk may return small rewards that I find not being worth it, worth my time, right? Yeah. So how do you make a balance between all of these scenarios? And, you know, you have to bring in multiple factors in, for example, age, uh, income, market conditions. You know, there are so many things that you have to put in place. So it's never a one size fits all. It's really about who you are, what you believe in, what's your current condition what's your current lifestyle what are you willing to sacrifice and at the end of the day what does it give you are you doing it for just the money or are you doing it for the journey for the excitement that one day you can look back and say that you've contributed to something big something that improved improved people's lives mm. it's really how you want to take a look at it right And that determines where you sit, whether you're a risk averse and you want to go the traditional route of investing where you're optimizing your 401k or you're allocating some of your income to some sort of investment account via Ameritrade, something like that, right? That's known. And by the way, I do that too, right? I go the route of investing in the stock market, investing in ETFs, uh, but also with my age, with my passion, with what I believe in, I can size, somewhat size, the risk that I take with venturing into AI startups. And that's pretty much how I take a look at it. It's never a one or zero type lens, binary lens. It's more of a dial-up lens. So basically yeah. in a year, you may see that There's so much, and we are living it now. There's so much noise into the AI space now. How do I dial it down a bit? Which is dial down the bucket, the AI bucket investment, and dial up something that's a little bit more stable, whether it's real estate. I'm just taking a few examples now, or traditional enterprise that are already public, etc. Or And how do I dial it back up when things are more stable? And that's going to, what's going to determine that is my risk tolerance. Another thing I guess that affects you is that you you have an entrepreneurial mind. Like you you don't only invest your money. As we discussed before this podcast, you also advise or like mentor. You invest your your time in the companies that you you want to partner with, to collaborate with. So that's also something to consider for, for some people like me right now, uh, time is extremely precious and I, I, I try to build things so I, I don't have like much time. And that's why I, I invest mostly in ETFs right now, just because I, I don't want to, to manage th more things than what I currently am, I'm doing. Since you, you invest both your money, your time. So like it's, it's a lot of in investment. Like if you, if you go with a company or not, how do you size The, the risk you, you will be taking with them? Or do you have any like list that you're going through or like a framework just, kind of thing? Yeah, framework or just like you, do you more feel just the person, the entrepreneur, the team, or do you have a framework? How, how does it work for you? Yeah, 
by the way, it's really difficult to size the risk. You really never know. I mean, especially the anecdotes that are plaguing startups today. I mean, you hear about horror stories of how startups fail. And, you know, 90% of them fail. Like when you hear stories like that, when then you say, well, how do I know that I'm looking at a 90% startup or a 10% startup, right? The 10% startup is kind of like the, the ones that are more viable for success. And I say viable, and I choose that word very carefully because still inside the 10%, they may be succeeding today and then five years later, who knows, they go down, right? So, so the way I look at it is one, understanding some of the reasons why startups fail, right? I was reading the, an article the other day from CB Insights and I saw, oh, wow, this is pretty cut and dry. Some of the five reasons that I can remember thinking about this now, one is running out of money. Two, they may be pushed out by a competitor. Three, it could be that what they're creating, the market doesn't really want it now. There's another one. The business model may not be a great fit. And then there's another one that I can remember too is pricing. There may be a flaw in the pricing model that they select. And there are, there are more in that article. I just don't remember what they are. When I saw these reasons, I could only bring it to one thing that's in common, which is you're spending too much money because you're not focused on solving that one problem that you vow to solve. A competitor kicks you out. That's because you're not focused on finding the right customer for your problem or you're not solving it better than the competitor. Right. You're 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 going down as a as a startup because the, the demand doesn't want it, the market doesn't want it. Well, that's because you've been building something people don't want, so you didn't spend enough time with the customer to understand their problem. So these top problems why startups fail lead me to say, okay, if I'm talking to a founder and listening to their ideas, I want to understand. How well do you understand the problem space? I want to know about that. How well do you understand the problem space? How well do you know your customer? Right? Those are the framework that I run it through. Mm. How do you know it's needed now? Why should we act on it now? How big is the market opportunity? What are the what is the competitive landscape? And why do you think you can solve it better? And to answer that question, that last question, we go into the people aspect of a startup. So looking into the team, do we have the right team members that can go after this problem space from a technology perspective or technical aspect or from a domain experience? Do we have the right people put together? Mm to solve this. The other aspect that are more on the emotional uh, intelligence space, how much experience have that person had uh, with interacting, with empathizing with, with customers? Are they able to motivate a room when they become leaders? Are they able to inspire investors when they get in the room? Are they able to explain things in the simplest way so that investors or customers won't have to second guess or guess what they're trying to express. You know, so those are the things that you kind of look for as quick signals to see, okay, do you have the right team working on the right problems at the right time, right? So therefore you are able to minimize the risk you're taking with a startup when you decide to say, Yes, uh, I'm going to put my money on it. And then other aspects too is, do, does this company have traction, right? What are the social proof, proofs that this, this startup have, right? So social proof can come in multiple ways. It could be that customers are expressing interest, whether it's a letter of intent that they've signed or they've already provided data to this startup so they can build a prototype. They made a commitment to that startup or they're already paying customers 
those are social proof that are very powerful that can help uh, an investor minimize their risk. And you also have the other aspect of social proof where a startup founder can show that, hey, I spoke to Bill Gates. Bill Gates said, this is a good idea. And here's my proof that I've talked to Bill Gates. And take a look at his article where he mentioned my startup. This is like one of the biggest social proof that exists that myself as an investor will use that as a data point for sizing the risk that I'm taking. So just to say there's no really one size fit all in terms of a framework to size up a risk and determine go versus no go in investing into a startup. But you do it enough, you start to tailor multiple frameworks based on the space you're trying to evolve in, right? I may have a different framework for a startup that's in healthcare versus a startup that's evolving in a less rigorous industry like healthcare, like something like, I don't know, gaming, for example, right? where data privacy in healthcare is a little bit more rigorous versus data privacy in gaming, right? I'm just taking an example, right? So my framework has to work and evolve with that versus a framework for investing in real estate. I have to pull another one. I can't just use one framework for every single situation or use case. So again, life is not binary. We should see it more as a dialed, dialed up experience, dialed up, dialed down experience. And you mentioned that you, once you were comfortable enough with artificial intelligence, you started, this is where you started investing. So how much do you need to know about either an industry or like about the startup? It's, it's not the startup itself, but the problem they are trying to fix. How much do you need to know about The, the, yeah, both the industries and their problem to consider that you know enough or are comfortable enough to invest. I guess that's pretty much uh, subjective. But in your case, do you need to be an expert and completely understand their solution, their problem, their their industry, and, and their their like ideal uh, audience or clients, or do you trust the team? And if you understand it somewhat well and the team seems really expert, you then like not blindly, but you, you trust them. What's your level of expertise that you, you want to have with regards to the, the company's field? Yeah, I mean, again, I would say it depends on different conditions and how are these conditions coming together, I would say if you're starting to invest in startups, you have it's probably best you start, you stick to what you know. Mm. You stick to what you know in terms of domain expertise and you start playing in that space so you can kind of minimize the negative effects of putting your eggs in the same basket, right? So you're You're able to filter out the bad apples in the space that you understand better than in the space that you don't understand. Now, as you grow confidence and you feel like you want to spread your eggs elsewhere, now this is where who you know and who you trust also matters. And who you trust, not necessarily not only the, the founders with whom I believe every investor should, especially if they're they're involved at an, at an early stage, they should form some sort of relationship with their founders. It's also who you know that's interested in the same space you're interested in. So for example, I don't consider myself an expert in AI, but I surround myself with people whom I call experts and who've been investing longer than I have. So in whom I trust. Yeah. So when they are leaning in to take a chance. I follow their lead sometimes when I need to, even though the bet I take may be smaller, but that's my point of entry into a world that I'm learning over time. So whom you know is really important. 
and then another thing too is with regards to the conditions, market conditions, for example, am I in a situation where the market conditions allows me to liberate some dry powder, which is a term that you know investors say about how much money you have available, how much cash you have available to allocate to investing. We've seen the past two years, a lot of companies or a lot of investors ran out of dry powder to, to allocate. A lot of their money were allocated to illiquid assets. So they couldn't liberate you know, cash to invest when the market was favorable, right? So if an opportunity comes to me today, although I'm not a fully an expert into it, but I found that my friends and my colleagues, my mentors are all vested into this. I could be unlucky that I don't have enough cash to invest into it, right? But if I'm lucky, yeah, I'll lean in a little bit more and take a, a little bit of risk to see what happens, right? And over time, I'll get more confident because I also have to do my homework. I can't just sign a check and not vest my time into it. And one of the vows that I make is one of the commitments that I make is that if I'm putting some money out for a startup, I have to continuously learn about the industry, learn about the space, problem space they're evolving in uh, from time to time, have touch points with these founders to understand how things are going and be, become someone of value to them as well. Right. Knowing that they are a limited team, they may not have. 360 degree view of how things are going. But when I have information that may be useful to them, I I have a trigger for surfacing these things to them. So creating value for them too. And that helps me grow. That helps me grow my confidence for next time. I can lean a little bit less onto what other people know. I can lean more onto what I know mm -hmm. to make potentially bigger bets if the opportunity shows up. Right, so hopefully that answers your your question. Yeah, I I just want to go back on on something you mentioned a, a bit earlier, but there are of course multiple factors that you consider, such as the, the founding team, the problem, and the timing. And so I wonder what's your opinion on like pivoting and changing problems, or wait, well, changing solutions, but even changing problems, and more specifically. Have you ever trusted a, a, a team or a, an entrepreneur enough to invest in their ID, even if it changes or evolves? Like, have you ever trusted someone enough that you wanted to invest in this person, whatever he builds? Yeah, there's a fine balance between really believing in an idea and not letting go versus knowing when to let go versus knowing when to pivot when all the market signals come at you. That's why, you know, it's always good to maintain a relationship with the founder because as a partner, as a friend or a partner, you want to be able to size up, you know, the level of commitment, which will change over time, right? What I mean by the commitment changes over time from a founder is it's good to have a founder that's receptive to feedback, right? Feedback from the market, feedback from customers. Companies like Slack exist today because they were able to pivot from an initial idea that lending them into a space that's much more successful, right? If they didn't let go of the initial idea, you wouldn't be hearing about Slack today, right? That's an yeah. example. But at the same time, you know, it doesn't really minimize the founder who has strong conviction about an idea. That's rather commendable. However, as an investor, as a friend, as a mentor, as a partner, it's the challenge is the challenge is how do I help this founder realized that maybe the time is not now for this idea. Mm. Here's another perspective that you should consider to stay afloat until the right time. And then you can act on your vision, right? So 
if initially I really believed in an idea and I realized the market conditions have changed and my partner, the co-founder, needs to evolve with that, I'll try my best to kind of like convince here, here's a better strategy so we can stay afloat during this period. And by the way, this period, maybe two to three years or four years, here's how you stay afloat while you fine tune this big vision. And here's how we will kind of deploy that mission, that vision that you've had from 10 years ago. Mm. Right. So when there's a will, there's a way. Right. And the will has to start with the will to be receptive to to that market feedback, because the market will talk to you. The market will let you know that they're ready to to use your product to solve their problems. They'll tell you when to be ready. And if you if you're one who's not willing to listen, while it might be a great idea, it may not necessarily be a great idea for now. Mm, and right. that could put you underwater. And then next thing you know, 10 years later, somebody else who came back to your original idea at the right time is more successful. And unfortunately, you know, some people take it very hard. Um, but yeah. And you mentioned market signals to like letting you know to pivot or not. Do, could you share a bit more about like what are those signals that, that one should be looking for if they, they should be pivoting or keep pushing in their current ID? Yeah, so market signals to me, and, uh, and just to say, you know, startups have different phases that they go through. And the typical one is what we call prototyping, then product market fit, then growth mode, then protector mode. I'm just naming them in a way that I can explain. So proto prototyping is more of a, you're building a proof of concept, you're building this demo that you want to show your initial customers, then you move to product market fit where you have a well-defined list of customers that really see value in the product that you built. That without this product, uh, a good amount of their operations will cease to exist or will be significantly impacted. And to me, that's product market fit, where you're starting to find this kind of like inertia to kind of kickstart, you know, the engine of that startup, right? Where you're cementing your way into this market space, right? And then after that, you go into what I call growth mode, where you're now trying to figure out who else in this market space may be having the same problem that we need to bring in with these vested customers and how do we get them how do we convince them that the traditional way or the traditional vendors that they were into are archaic or no longer solving their issues that i am the one you want to get to and that's a very hard place to be that's a very very difficult place to be then if you achieve a good growth rate now, as you acquire, as you've acquired your initial customers, you're growing, et cetera, you turn into more of a protector now. Now you say, okay, I've acquired these big companies, these big fish. How do I keep them there for the long term? Now you're starting to think about what are the features you need to launch to keep them or keep that value proposition high for them yeah. so that they don't leave me to a competitor. And that's another very hard phase too. And as companies traverse these phases, you want to make sure that they have the right tools to survive these phases, right? I may have diverted uh, my response to another way, another thing, but just if you could remind me of the essence of your question again, I can zone in on the right answer for you. My question was the, the market signals to know when to pivot? Yes, or was that yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Absolutely, the market signals, I remember now. So, knowing these phases, right, we're going to explore 
for example, a customer or a startup that has achieved, let's say, product market fit. Well, some of the signals that I can think about now, I have product market fit. I'm ready to scale. I'm ready to grow. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, and growth means that you have to do, you have to test different things, right? It's like you're casting your fish net or your, uh, fish wire, right? And then you're trying to see, okay, what fish will bite. And every mm-hmm. time you have to test that, you see your response and you do more of it, you pivot, right? Sometimes you have to change the bait until they bite, right? Some of the market signals is, you know, looking at how much money are you spending, you know, trying to change that fish bait, right? And and seeing the return, right? If you're finding yourself constantly spending money to acquire new customers and you're not actually getting that return or that return on investment, right? That cost, a cost of acquisition is significantly high and you're not getting a return, over time, those those are the first signals that says, hey, you know, maybe you're not knocking on the right doors and you need to really go back to the drawing board to understand the the customer space, right? Maybe you've honed in on the problem space already. You want to spend more time on the customer space to kind of like knock on the right doors, right? And if you've exhausted all of that data and you still don't have the right response now, it's a matter of it's only a matter of time that your original customers may start to leave you because their problems too will evolve over time. So, you know, I'm just giving you an example of what kind of signals can you get from the market, right? And there are many, right? We could talk about that all day. There are many. I was just taking an example of. What kind of signals you need to, and this is where you know founders will succeed in pivoting. You know they succeed really because they are not stubborn. They are willing to listen to the market. They are willing to listen to the experts that they've spent time hiring, uh, or the advisors that they spent time you know onboarding um, to find the best way to acquire customers, right, and not drown in the egotistical journey of believing in an ideal that most to their to contrary to their belief most folks didn't want yeah so would you have any uh, common pitfalls in mind for both advisors investors and for entrepreneurs yeah i mean there are some common pitfalls distractions trying to solve everything at the same time is one that is so underrated right so so many founders think that solving it all is the best approach and i'm gonna get another one too that's more pertinent to today's condition is quickly calling themselves a gen ai startup to me it's a pitfall Because what that tells me is you're not willing to tell me what's really going on under the hood. If you cannot express that in a clear way, then I'll question whether you're an AI startup or not. Mm. Right. That's another pitfall. Another pitfall is, you know, not aligning as a founding team, right? When there are diverting opinions floating around about how to approach a problem, how to solve a problem for customers. That's another pitfall I can think about. Scaling too fast is another one. It's a little bit counterintuitive where when startups get money too much, too fast, and we've seen that right in the AI space where VCs were willing to cut big checks super fast before even startups had a product a working product, a working prototype that, you know, founders get that complacent. They felt that 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 money they had in the vicinity in the, in the bank was some sort of blanket protection against any conditions, right? Those are the common pitfalls that I can think about. Awesome. I, a bit related to pitfalls, but also the, the, the market signals. The, my last question is to, I, I want to ask you right now, um, 
from what we are seeing for the, the jobs and like what is, I guess, publicly available, the market doesn't seem ideal. So I, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on the, the current market for investing and for startups? And also, where is the potential or where do you think it will be like soon? Is there any industry that is booming or where's the potential in both startups or investments? And is what are the market conditions right now in the, the startup world? A quick response to that is nobody knows. I don't know. And, but also, I can say opportunities are everywhere. Um, the startups that I'm involved in right now that fascinate me are the ones that are able to explain what happens if they remove the AI aspect of things. Yeah. How will they solve a problem? If they can tell me how they will solve a problem without AI, then I can get very excited about that. That's a good interview question. <laughs> right? So, and I'm not talking about the entropics of the world because they are like really AI startups, the open AI of the world, right? Without AI, mm -hmm. open AI doesn't exist. Yeah. I'm talking about the companies who are vowing to leverage AI to solve business problems. Yeah. Right, I'm talking about the AI applications or AI enabled applications. If I remove that aspect, how are you solving that problem? And oftentimes you will see that it may become an engineering problem or architecture problem. And then the AI is an added tool that gives you some sort of competitive advantage. But overall, if you're able to express that end to end user experience to me in a way that convinces me that competitors cannot copy it, then it's a more of a compelling story that convinces me that this is something that's interesting for me to invest in. All right. I don't know if I'm answering that question, but you know, it's that's the way I can see it. Now, if you if you should think about another company, let's say somebody comes to me and say, hey, I'm building a competitor to Entropic, then you know it's a different framework that I would use for that. Right. First of all, how much money do you have? Because these guys were ingested with hundreds of millions of dollars to mm. be where they are. How do you tackle bigger aspects of things? Right now, you're dealing with a foundational model that needs vast amount of data. So how do you tackle the big issues of today? Data privacy, data security and everything like that, bias, etc. How do you tackle those hard to solve problems? How will you solve it? better than the existing competitors today, the open yeah. AIs, the clouds, the, the, the entropics, et cetera, stability AIs of the world, right? So it's a, it's a different framework to apply mm. there. And believe it or not, there, are, there will be more foundational models that will come to life. And one thing that I think will happen is over time, these foundational models will get cheaper to build because we'll achieve some training optimization, and even inference optimization. So uh, it's an interesting space. So I'm excited. This is a quick interruption to remind you to leave a like and a five-star review if you are enjoying this episode. It helps a lot both to let me know that the episode was good, but also to make other people discover it. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. you like to digest what's going on in the AI space, But why did you start doing that? First, when did you start doing that on, on LinkedIn? And why LinkedIn? And what were you doing? Like your first few posts, what were they about and, and why? Yeah, I mean, at first LinkedIn, I saw it as an avenue for marketing yourself to find a job. Yeah. It did have this social aspect to it where at first you only connected with folks who worked at the same place as you. And then later on, I guess it's to resume for you, I can say something like curiosity is what got me there. Curious about new ways of solving problems. So back in 2019, for example, I started, you know, becoming very curious about how to code in Python, for example. And I started sharing my journey on LinkedIn. 
And this was about the same time where you know, building machine learning experiences were coming up about. Right? So yeah. I was learning how to build the simplest experiences in Python, sharing my 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 journey. And at the same time, AI is coming up. So I started reading about it. I started to learn, you know, how Python fits the profile as the go-to uh, language for, you know, coding machine learning experiences and, you know, talking about them, talking about the subject from time to time and gaining traction in terms of folks who were probably on the same journey as I was. What really helped me is being able to be, being vulnerable, being able to share an opinion and not stick to it necessarily because yeah. opinions can change. Opinion, opinions should be able to change based on a better perspective that you may receive from someone else. So I didn't take anybody who contradicted what I said personally. I actually saw it as an opportunity for me to learn even more. And over time, I got more confident about what I was sharing. So just to resume for you, curiosity got me there and an alignment with what I've been doing as well in the past, which is manipulating data to generate business value. And AI is doing just that. And uh, really building some sort of discipline around posting on a regular basis. So now you create a habit of folks waiting for you to share your opinion on something and also feel it, making people feel welcome. So when I post, somebody puts a comment in, I would reply back, et cetera. And over time, I was favorable. I mean, the LinkedIn algorithm favored my my post and more, more and more people started to see it until I got the recognition. And the other thing that happened in the mean in in the meantime, in parallel, that I can't deny is that me joining a, a fan company also helped, or shall we call them Meng now, also helped because I had the opportunity to raise my voice and say, hey, I would like to play here. And I was grateful enough to have leaders that agreed that this was a good space for me to evolve in. And I was lucky enough to be able to tinker in that space. And that also helped me gain confidence. And that also helped me with, you know, not getting approval, but at least getting the attention of the community. And when you reach these kind of position, when you reach like a company that has high visibility, when that you start working for, you have to be conscious of what you say. You have to, it's a responsibility to not mislead people. So yeah. when, before I put a post out, although I know it may not be 100% correct and I'm open to feedback, I also have to make sure I do my due diligence so that I don't share things that may be damaging or, or else, right? Mm. So, Are you still posting every day? I try to. Uh, at least I try to do five days a week. These days, it's been r a really challenge for me to manage my calendar. Um, I I found myself needing and wanting to spend more time with family. And that really is what's important to me, um, even though it doesn't take me much effort to post anyways on LinkedIn. The reason is I spend a good bit amount of time curating, not curating, but setting up the information pipeline that comes to me. So basically identifying good article sources and other avenues that brings me information that I can then digest and explain in a more digestible way to my followers. And because I have these avenues or these articles, these quality pipeline of information, it takes me a couple minutes to just share an opinion on what I've read and post, right? So it's probably more taking me more time now is when a lot of people are commenting, I have to take some time throughout the day to answer them because I do not like to leave them hanging, uh, as they mm -hmm. say, right? So 
But regardless, I try to set boundaries in terms of like what it means to be on LinkedIn, what it means to be at work or what it means to spend time with family and what it means to spend time with myself as well for my mental health. Right. So I've been trying to lean in more towards uh, that versus uh, getting lost in the LinkedIn verse. So. (laughs) And why LinkedIn rather than having a blog or doing videos or a podcast, you seem to, to be able to talk like very well. And also you have a lot to say. So why not having your own platform or something you could go like, I, I don't know more in, not necessarily more in depth, but let's yeah, say, why not trying another platform? Yeah. Time management, crowdiness. Uh, I mean, if you think about YouTube, it's a very crowded space. Mm. Twitter as well. I guess it's just luck. There's a luck factor there too. And then also from a time management perspective, earlier on when I was starting to post, creating videos takes so much energy for some reason. Yeah. I got to take and retake, take and retake. So I started tinkering with that. And I wasn't even doing like five minutes videos. I'm talking about the 30 second videos. That was super high energy for me. And I was like, okay, knowing this, I definitely do not want to have a YouTube channel knowing that I'm, I'm working full time. I have a family, etc. And that was an easy decision for me. Right. It's so TLDR here is time management, right. And available time for you to, to, to do those. Like I'm not ruling out ever creating a podcast or having a YouTube channel. It's just that cold start that I'm kind of stuck with right Mm. now where it will feel for a long time uh, lonely in these spaces. And I felt that on LinkedIn, but I didn't really care for it because I was so passionate about the subject that I felt like some folks eventually will start listening. And they did where when I look at the value to effort ratio of doing the same on YouTube or Twitter or TikTok is not there for me. It, it, it seems like reaching critical mass will take way too long because of so much noise already happening in these platforms. Yeah, I think uh, I completely understand. That's also how I feel just for, like I've, I've started on YouTube and Uh, I guess I also got lucky after after months and years of of weekly posts, but I I got lucky that it 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 worked somewhat well. And it's true that, for example, I've I've tried going on Twitter, and it's I don't know, it's I don't. Well, first I, I'm I'm extremely bad with social media. Like I don't understand how how to waste time on there, and I, I just can't have Twitter open. I, I don't know what to do. I don't. I just don't like that. And and so it's extremely hard to try to post like on on Twitter. You you if you want to grow, you need to post multiple times a day. I think like you need to be very active and basically part of a of the Twitter community. And that's something, yeah, incredibly demanding and hard. And it's extremely saturated as well. I don't mm-hmm. know if like what Elon Musk is doing is helping or not, but it's it seems quite impossible to to start. N- not impossible, but yeah extremely complicated to start and grow on such a platform so i definitely make sense to yeah i guess just like leverage what you currently have and what you built which also took a lot of efforts and uh, and luck Correct. and Correct. i i just wonder um was it your id from start on LinkedIn to build some kind of personal brand or it was more to share, um, like to explain things like what, what was your, your ultimate goal? Is it to build like the Greg branding and, and try to, to yeah build your personal branding to, so, so that it has reward rewards or something attached to it, or was it more for other reasons? No. To answer shortly, uh, it was more about wanting to share things that are excited and learn in return. 
learn more in return when people interacted with yeah with my sharings so linkedin felt more of a natural space for me to start expressing those things and with a mixture of discipline and luck it 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 kind of worked out in terms of reward i can say yes because of the community you kind of build this brand but really the real reward is having a community that helps you learn from different perspectives yeah now linkedin is different from others it's not like i'm getting a paycheck from advertisers that are accessing my post anything like that right to get more impressions for their products is different right you don't get money from having a sizable community on on linkedin you could you could do so on other platforms like 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 youtube but it's not the same on linkedin so the true reward for me is really having a community that can help me be a better person a better employee or a better citizen a better professional when i need help that's that's the true reward for me i can lean in lean on 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 my community to find for example a sales expert that i can connect to a startup founder who's my friend right and therefore i create value for for both people right and and to me this is super super rewarding when i'm able to connect the dots or make an intro or solve a problem myself or right when someone comes to me and say hey i need help and i'm able to spend time and help that person that 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 really feels good and everything else works out right like or fits in right anything whatever is going to work out is going to work out but it was never about making a conscious decision to improve or create Greg's brand. I I that was the last thing in my mind. And it's still the last thing in my mind. Like what does that mean anyway? Do companies really pay attention to that? I don't know. Like we're going to hire Greg because of his brand. Well, <laughs> does that is that true or is it we're going to hire Greg because he know he knows a thing or two about the position we're trying to hire for, right? Yeah. So that's a little bit more constrained. And at the end of the day, that's probably the nature of most social media platforms that reward you with a community when you are among the folks uh, sharing information that most people care about. So if you look at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, You'll see the same kind of pattern with folks who are sharing this, uh, the same around a, a subject. Uh, and then now you become the person people look out for to ingest information, right? So, yeah. yeah. Now in, in artificial intelligence, mainly, there's a whole new field of like curators that didn't exist before. It was just like we, we followed the news and that's that's pretty much it. But now it's it's kind of a, a full time job to figure out what's important or not from like everything that is re released every day or every hour. It's just it's just crazy. Even on LinkedIn there are like multiple people that I follow to to see the new research and the new cool things. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just very, it, it transformed a lot since since when I started. And I didn't even start it long ago. It was like in, just like you in 2019. Yeah, it's really crazy how how much it changed in four, four or five years. <laughs> lots of, lots of noise. And the funny thing is, I don't know how much effort people are making to ensure that they are ingesting the right thing. And that's a personal effort you have to make mm. is to build that quality pipeline of information. And you may say, hey, I know Louis Bouchard. I know when I hear him put out a new YouTube video that I do not have to go out there and confirm that Louis Bouchard has done his job to make sure that he's reporting something accurate, as accurate as possible, right? So 
not a lot of people are maybe 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 not a lot of people are making that effort to ensure that their their pipelines are of high quality, right? And because of this increase in content creators with the rise of Gen AI, et cetera, you know, you will find a lot of misinformation and and other negative effects that will further divide people's opinions. And hopefully there are also forces at play that are vowing to reduce that those negative effects. As you know, on, on YouTube, I often share and explain research papers in artificial intelligence, and I try to like explain them as simply as possible. I always knew that, of course, when I take a, a, a paper that seems interesting, that I see that has potential, like a stable diffusion. I I saw the paper, it was really cool. It wasn't stable diffusion, it was latent diffusion and way before stable diffusion was created. But I, I knew that it has potential. I didn't know it, it, it was going to be such a, a big thing, but I knew that making a video about it should get some like somewhat good reach or or whatever. And it did work that way back in the days. But now, for example, I recently did a video about a paper that was just released like a, on the same day that uh, basically um, the DALI 3, DALI 3 paper was released like Monday morning. And I, I saw it as soon as it was re released. I was super excited. So I just r worked on it all day and released the video like at the end of the day. And... I was the first one about the first content of explaining the research papers of Dali2. Like, pretty sure it's it, it's been th that way for Dali2 and for other papers that I've seen like first. And the videos always perform well, and like it's obvious just because it's a, a new thing that is really cool. And I explain how it works, and it, it's nice to me. But for for this time, I I published it, and it made like almost no no views. And then I looked on YouTube and I saw like the, that there were at least exactly. hundreds of, of videos that said like DALI 3 explained or how does DALI 3 work? But they were all like a month old or like one or two weeks old where there was no information on how it worked, but people explained like how it works on ChatGPT, like how to use it and things like mm -hmm. that. But it was not at all about like what's DALI 3 like how is it trained and what's the architecture or like what is it and it's just like the, these i don't know keywords or, or like this this sentence of like trying people that want to find how DALI 3 works or how it was trained it's just like extremely diluted and so many people just sharing the quick news of like DALI 3 on chat gpt that you can use right away and it's, I guess it, it it it's the same on on LinkedIn and other platforms. But I I definitely I saw that uh, last month or like two months ago on YouTube, and it definitely hurts my my channel. But like it's, yeah, it's annoying. It's dangerous also for many people just to they want just to take that specific example. But if they want to understand more about generative models that that creates good images, they will just find videos of people using ChatGPT to prompt DALI 3. Like it's not related to what they are looking for, but it's like they are saturating the, the keywords and all the thumbnails and all the things that make it seems like that they will explain you how it works, but it's it's not at all this. Yeah, and that that's what makes it difficult, right? How does the algorithm know that Lewis's video is what actually goes under the hood to explain how DALI 3 works mm. versus more of a shallow one, although the keywords are perfect for that video to get traction, to get eyeballs. But when you actually watch the video, it's really not what it seems. It doesn't really go under the hood. It just tells you, here, here's how you use it yeah. with chat GPT, et cetera. But it doesn't really explain, oh yeah, here's how it's working, here's why in a very layman term, like as you usually do, which are videos, right? So now, how do we ensure on YouTube that the algorithm will exactly know who the user is, 
what the query is from the user saying, hey, I want to understand Dali and understand that Lewis's video is the best fit for that mm. for that query and really minimize the result of those who don't really who don't actually go deep into the details, right? Versus what you typically do. And it's a difficult thing, right? Because so many choices now that yeah. folks don't know what to pick. And overall, you have so many content creators that the number of viewership that you have goes down. And I've seen the same thing on LinkedIn too, where only a few were bold enough to talk about AI and they got the viewership, which went down significantly this year. Yeah. Because now so many more people felt comfortable talking and uh, some information may or may not be accurate or solving a, a user problem. And by user problem, I define that as a user who wants to have access to validated information. Uh, so the algorithm is trying to do its best to favor a content creator, uh, but at the expense of individual mm. top performance, right? So, yeah, I assume we will soon reach a point where all the, the content for videos or, or posts is, is processed into the algorithm, not just like title and, and, and stats. And it will just understand what the person is looking for and what the video is providing and match the best thing, I guess. Gen AI will help for that in the near future. Well, yeah, let's hope. But, you know, there are some things that other people play on a lot, like thumbnails, for example, as you mentioned. Uh, I may have a good enough title, but if my thumbnail is I ca I ca is an eye catcher, then I may generate more views than you, right? Yeah. Where I make sure I show up maybe at the mid page of the query result or maybe at the bottom of the query result, but because the thumbnail is so, is an eye catcher that I end up getting more views than you who has probably spent a fair amount of time perfecting that title uh, to, to get more eyeballs, right? Yeah. So there are so many levers that you need to play with that is that are hard to control on platforms like YouTube, that is really hard to acquire organic views. Mm. Today is more is harder versus yesterday, where there were less players in the field, and that's happening yeah. across platforms, it's not just YouTube. We've seen that on LinkedIn as well. Yeah, I guess I would recommend anyone starting like a journey into trying to either make videos or having a blog or. Twitter or LinkedIn, but I will strongly advise to not have any um, goals in mind or goals in mind or like high expectations, just because it's definitely a lot of work, very difficult. You need to be super lucky and extremely consistent, and still you may, you may not get anything out of it. So you definitely need to do that for yourself and to learn, and. And so even like, for example, for a day three video, I, I don't care if it didn't work well. It just, it helped me understand the, more specifically in this case, it was a training of the, the, the algorithm, which was really cool. And I just enjoyed making it. So it's like completely fine. But yeah, it's, I don't know where, where it's, it's where it'll go, but I'm not sure about the, the future of like content creation and things like that. It's a bit scary with. Yeah. All that's that's going on. Yeah, I'd love to talk with you more about artificial intelligence. We didn't even <laughs> enter the topic. No, but not even. Yeah, we, yeah, we could we could definitely do another episode on like the just large language models and all your your thoughts on what's happening since ChatGPT. It's just crazy. But yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time for talking with me. And if please feel free to share anything you'd like to share to to the people listening. And why you can also uh, tell us why why people should follow you on LinkedIn, what you are sharing more precisely uh, these days, and yeah, why should why they should check you out? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can say is you know stay curious. 
lean in more, say yes more. Uh, and say yes more doesn't mean you say yes to everything and anything. You mm. just say yes more when an opportunity shows up. You may you have no idea how that may change your lives yeah. forever, right? Lean in more. And um, you are part of this movement more than you could ever imagine, right? Just because you're not an AI expert does not mean you cannot become one or you cannot contribute. So, and in terms of LinkedIn, I mean, it's it's very subjective, right? You may find my post useful, you may not find my post useful. But at the end of the day, if you give me the honor to consume my post and give me some feedback, then I can vow to become a little bit better over time, which will then, you know, hopefully serve your needs more and serve the people who fit your profile more over time. So that's that's what I can ask for. And I thank you too, Luis, so, for such a great conversation. I had fun. Oh, yeah, I had a lot of fun as well. And yeah, thanks again for the hour and a half and all the amazing insights you personally gave me just regarding startups. And I I'm just getting into that. So I, I really love talking about this and you, you helped me a lot. And I'm sure you help a lot of people listening. So thanks again. I wish you an amazing weekend and I, I will see you next time. I thank you too. All right. Talk soon. <laughs>